Talking to each other yes. rather than talking to Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, thank you for joining us here today at Beyond Borders Question Time. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name's Alistair, I'm a journalist here in Scotland, and with us today is Madeleine Habib, um, who, if you don't know, um, Madeleine was the first female skipper of the Medicine Sun Frontier um, Dignity One. Her work with organisations such as M M MSF, Greenpeace, um, and other organisations across the world, including the Women's Boats to Gaza, which tended to be the first ship that tried to break the um, illegal the Gaza blockade, um, which stops aid going into Gaza. So yeah, we're here today, we'll have a quick chat with um, Madeleine and, and find out a bit about your experiences. And firstly, I think, you know, the, 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 the boat to Gaza um, was the first, and, you know, to be the first female skipper off, off that boat. Um, you know, what, what, was, what was that like? What was the, the plan of, of that like? You know, were you nervous? Were you... Scared, how did you feel before you left? The, the boats to Gaza actually do have quite a comprehensive history and the unjust blockade of Gaza has been in place since 2008. In 2010, there was an attempt by a, another flotilla to break the blockade and in that instance, nine people were killed at close range and a tenth person died from their injuries. So the blockade and the Freedom Flotilla does have quite a legacy. In 2016, there was an idea to have a, a women's flotilla to Gaza and despite our best intentions and a lot of effort and a lot of energy, in the end there was only one boat that went. And the idea was to have a boat with women on board to show solidarity with the women of Palesti Palestine and also to represent women on the front line because women in activism tend to not have a front line role and so it was partly that. But mostly it was to shine a light on the particular suffering of the women in Palestine. So it was a monumental feat of organisation on a shoestring budget, to say the least. We had some terrible mechanical issues and a lot of um, difficulties with actually even being able to get the boats underway from Spain. We left Spain illegally. I was impersonating another person. The boat was unregistered, unnamed and uninsured and we were under Coast Guard. <laughs> well, we were supposed to be under Coast Guard observation when we slipped out in the middle of the night and illegally made our way to France. But fortunately, on arrival in Corsica, they seemed to just accept that uh, we were legally in the country and we could carry on. And I'm not nervous about being at sea and I was... Uh, I wasn't nervous about the capability of the boat, but of course I was concerned about what would happen when we had an interface with the Israeli Defense Forces. Historically, the interface between the Freedom Flotilla and the Israeli Defense Forces has been a violent one. There has never been an, an interaction which has been peacefully resolved. It has always resulted in violence being used against peaceful protesters. And I was very adamant that I would not be um, subjected to violence and nobody on board my boat would be subjected to violence. So that was really important to me. We had Mairead Maguire on board, who's a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and Anne Wright, who's a retired American US general, both over the age of 70. Most of the women on board the boat had no seafaring experience. They were really in an unfamiliar environment and I had an obligation to keep them safe. And, and do you think um, the, like part of the reason that the approach that you took and not wanting to have a violent confrontation. And do you think that was influenced by the fact that it was maybe the sort of type of approach that we would take to politics? It, it doesn't need to be a grandstanding shouting match. That actually, um, you know, dialogue and, and the way that we can speak together um, is a sort of a better way to approach activism. And um, do you think that was influenced by the the boat that you took and the fact it was led by women? And um, you know, what, how how do you think that happened? I think. We definitely, as a team of women, had a more conciliatory approach to how we wanted to present ourselves and how we wanted to interact with the Israeli Defence Forces. Of course, I always said, whenever we talked about what was going to happen, I would always say, in the unlikely event that we get intercepted by the Israelis, because I really wanted to keep it in our minds that the goal was to arrive in Gaza and to be a beacon of hope for the people of Gaza. And so I really clung to that, and although we did talk about what would happen, I always tried to preface it with, in the unlikely event that we get stopped. Um, I, I was very adamant about having a peaceful interface, and I think that's a lot about my background as well. 
many years on Greenpeace vessels, lots of non-violence training. I've been arrested many times. I know how it, how it feels in that tense moment when people jump on board your boat um, and how your reaction towards those people who are probably frightened as well, but that how you behave determines how you're treated. And I guess, um, sorry to hand you, but obviously you were, you were cut from a ship which didn't have people who would experience that being at sea. I guess usually you know you would have crew members on board who who would you know be used to sailing. And um, apart from the fact, like you're saying, you were leaving um, the the port in Spain illegally and things like that. Um, was that sort of a, a new experience for you to develop the skills you've got as a captain by you know working with people who maybe aren't familiar with um, maritime and, and seafaring? There were two other women on board who did have some sailing experience who did the watches with me, but. There were definitely times when it was difficult because there was nobody else with any kind of mechanical experience or who understood how to navigate electricity or any of those other systems that you have on board a vessel. So, and to be honest, nobody was particularly interested in it either, which was <laughs> rather exhausting. But um, in, in some ways that was one of the more frustrating aspects of the trip. And I think that if women want to be considered equals, and want to behave as equals, we also have to take on equal responsibility and not just imagine that someone else is going to fix things for us. So sometimes I am irritated by the lack of curiosity that's shown by some women towards things that they don't understand. So rather than trying to work out how to how to understand it, they're more likely to say, I don't understand it. Yeah, and you mentioned at the start, you know, women often take a, a backroom role when it comes to political activism. And what would your message be out there to, to women who, who want to get involved in maybe you know more out there in you know actions when it comes to, to social justice, um, like yourself? How how do they get involved in that? How do they find their place within um, a sort of activist movement? I think it's important to have the skills. So develop the skill set so that you are a valuable team member. Because if you don't have skills and you can't present yourself as a valuable team member you will be asked to wash the dishes and which is a which is unacceptable because people should try and, and offer you the skills but if you can skill yourself up and arrive as somebody who has something to offer I think that's the trick and when you get to the well I always found that when I got to the boat I just always put myself beside the engine and started driving you know like I was never going to be the passenger and then just moving into the sort of situation in, in Palestine and Israel just now and we're speaking at, I guess, quite a, a toxic time for the debate in the UK especially. We've seen um, sorry, people who, who have done Palestinian activism, whether they be Jewish or not, sort of vilified um, within the press and within politics, um, often being described as anti-Semitic, um, moved away from Palestinian activism. A lot of people um, are quite scared to get involved in even talking about um, what's going on just now. Um, how, how do you think we move away from that to a situation where where we can respect um, that anti-Semitism, wherever, wherever it comes, is wrong. But we can have sort of a sensible conversation um, about the situation there and also how people can get involved um, with an activism um, to do something about it. Mm. Well, I think it is really important not to vilify a nation and not to cast Israel as an evil nation, to recognise that it's a nation of five million people or, or however many people live there and that it's made up of individuals and you, we're never going to work our way towards peace if we imagine that all of those people are evil. So st stop with the stereotypes, consider people individuals, um, and don't demonize a nation. And move away from the idea of, of this anti-Semitic language, which is time-consuming, energy-consuming, and just focus on a peace process. So focus on a, a resolution rather than focusing on the differences, I think is really important. When we were boarded by the Israeli Defense Force, uh, it was an entirely peaceful interface. And um, when, when the people came on board, we actually welcomed them on board. We learned to say, welcome on board in Hebrew. So it was a very disarming experience for the Israeli Defense Force. And we had tea laid out on the table, we had everything set. And we welcomed them and we said, we are the women's boat to Gaza, we'd like to explain to you why we're here, what we're doing, so that you understand our mission. And 
it really diffused the situation and it developed a dialogue and it's just like what this weekend is all about is developing a dialogue and understanding that there are different perspectives to the same story and uh, it was a, actually a very beautiful and moving evening we as we approached Gaza and well we were being taken to Ashdod but as the sun set you could see the bright lights of Ashdod and then the Gaza Strip with no lights at all because there's no electricity and we asked to have a few minutes silence and we all sat together and we looked at Gaza and the Israeli soldiers were sitting interspersed with all of us. We were all mixed up together just like a bunch of humanity on board this really small boat. And I think we all felt the same thing. We all felt the helplessness and the, the need for change in the situation. And then we got out the guitar and started singing peace songs and the Israeli soldiers were asking for songs like Give Peace a Chance. I mean, we, we are all individuals. They, they're young people who are in the, in the, doing their military service, that's the perfect moment to open their minds to the possibility of a peaceful future. And, and did they share that with you when you were speaking to them? Yeah, it was a really beautiful exchange. A lot of people said, we wish that we weren't in this situation, and I have a friend who came from Gaza, and I was on a kibbutz with this person, and all, you know, everybody had some story that they did want to share with us, and they treated us with respect, and the, Although to be arrested and everything like that, it's not a particularly dignified process and the being searched is not particularly dignified. But when we were in detention, we engaged in lots of conversations with other inmates, with, with the prison officers and everything. And I think that, I hope that that legacy will live on much more than if they just jabbed me with a taser and I've been screaming and writhing on the ground. I, I feel like what we did should have a better legacy. And it's interesting that, um, I think if, if your mission had had ended like that, mm -hmm. you know, more violently, and it would have probably got a lot more press coverage than it did. Um, do, do you, what, what do you think about that? Do you think the fact that it was... I don't think that press coverage is worth it. I, I think press coverage of a violent interface is has less value than the reality of a peaceful interface. We were the, the women's peace boat to Gaza. We were on a boat called Zaytuna, which means olive, it was the branch of peace. For us to be engaged in some kind of violent interface, no, I don't feel like getting more media hits has that value. And, and I guess, you know, just to end off, what's next for you in terms of your activism? And how do you think people should be challenging their energies um, when it comes to sort of global activism and trying to change things globally? Um, you know, what's next for you? And also, what would you encourage people to look at um, that they might want to think about just now? I think in the Palestinian context of activism, Media does have, uh, but social media and interactive media has a really big part to play and there's some really amazing organisations and documentaries being made. There's the documentary about the surf club in Gaza, which I highly recommend. It's a really uplifting story, really beautiful film to watch. Um, on a more popular front, there's Arab Idol. There's um, a, an organization called Not Just Numbers, which is Palestinian people telling their stories. And there's one in particular about them waiting for the women's boat to Gaza to arrive. And a woman telling her story of why she thinks that we're important. And you know, that a, was a very strength giving thing for me. So I think that as activists, maybe the days of, um, of large protests marching down the street, those things might have had their day. We need to be more creative and forward thinking. A weekend like this is a really positive representation of what of what dialogue can do. What's next for me is uh, I want to focus um, maybe on a larger scale on the interface between humanitarian and maritime sectors. So I'm actually working in Ethiopia at the moment, which is a very exciting country to work in, in the grips of a peaceful revolution, which is almost unheard of, and looking at um, the importance of trade in the development of a country. And, and just ask me, um, could you tell us a little bit about you know, people who, who may be a little bit involved in activism within the UK, just have maybe been on a few marches? Um, if they see you and think, you know, actually, um, I want to go on a boat um, to you know, countries all over the world and see what I can do to help. How, how do they do that? I, you know, how do they get involved? Well, like I said, you need to develop the skills first. So everybody needs to do their um, SDCW95 basic <laughs> safety training course. And once you've got that under your belt, just uh, go down to your nearest yacht club and get some sailing skills. That's what I would recommend. 
Um, it's a kind of a niche market. I'm not saying that there are lots of ships out there that you're going to get on board. And there are lots of ways to have activism. If you're, if you're a good climber, then develop your climbing skills, get your rope access work, and there's all kinds of activism involved in climbing. So it's developing the skill sets that you have. If, if you have journalistic skills, filming skills, many ways to help. There's some really great organization like Food Not Bombs, which I really love, where people just feed large numbers of other activists. Brilliant. And so I think we're going to see if anyone has any questions to ask you. And so maybe take two at a time. Um, two at a time? Yeah. Um, so, one at a time, sorry. Okay. One at a time. Right. Um, so uh, the person just at the back there. Thanks very much. That's absolutely fascinating, and I absolutely couldn't agree more. To, that if you can find a way of realizing that the person in the uniform yeah. or challenging you is actually a person, and often a rather frightened person, it's really helpful. And just that, when you were talking about food at the end there, just a small um, story, a small example of what something we did, which was that we were we were demonstrating at Fas Lane, a nuclear yes. weapons base, and part of it to have a bit of fun and lighten things up a bit was to have a burn supper. So we had a piper, and the piper brought in the haggis, and we did the whole thing. And then after we'd done it, we presented the haggis to the chief inspector of Strathclyde Constabulary, <laughs> who suddenly started smiling and laughing, and we had an interaction, and then we met some of the other police officers. It was all fine. And of course, that's not nearly as intimidating as dealing with the IDF, but um, yeah, not a fraction as intimidating as dealing with the IDF. But it was just an example of how if you connect with people through humour or humanity or eating together, drinking tea together, it is a big and it helps them to relax and also helps other people with you to relax. And it's recognising what your adversary is, what is it you're fighting against because the people who are there to prove to act in, in a security role or a military role are not actually the enemy, that's not what you're trying to change, you're trying to change the status quo between two nations. So getting tasered or having a violent interaction with somebody in a uniform is not really a step forward. Um, anyone else got any questions? Um, I was just wondering, you've been in so many dangerous situations, what exactly, and knowing that previously in the past, especially with the women's boat to Gaza, that there has been uh, some casualties, sadly, um, what drives you, I mean, kind of, what coping mechanisms do you have when you encounter uh, when you find yourself in these situations of danger? I actually think I got very good training in Greenpeace when I first started in nonviolent direct action and the way that you comport yourself and, and that initial interface. Greenpeace had some interesting ideas like putting women on the front line because it tends to diffuse the situation. So best to have an old woman and a young boy or something. I can't remember exactly what the ideal combination was for being least likely to be beaten, but it was something along those lines. And um, when you have a strong conviction about what you want to do, you are more willing to take risks. Often the way things are edited makes them look much more risky than they really were. And generally in direct activism, for every minute of interesting video, there was 10 hours of being cold and wet, and you've already eaten all your supplies, and you're almost wishing that you would get arrested. There's, there is actually quite a lot of that where you feel like, okay, I've made my point now, <laughs> I'm ready to go home. And if you do have a good skill set, and you are physically capable of, of doing the things that you're doing, and you also have some negotiating skills, it's not nearly as scary as it could be. It can also go horribly wrong, and I know people who have had really terrifying moments in activism too, though. Not to denigrate that. <laughs> um, great, so any, anyone else got any questions? Well, I actually do, okay. so I'll sneak in there. Um, I was just going to ask, because you mentioned earlier something about the, the press's coverage of war being less important than their non-coverage of peaceful movements. Do you think there's an opportunity and do you think a, a, a need for the press to reorient what they focus on and to have a, a more kind of a positive, a peaceful, you know, these not so memorable or dramatic moments being covered? Do you think that's needed within the humanitarian kind of activism around this or we just keep doing what we're doing and ignore it? I, I do think that there is definitely a place for that, a place for covering 
conciliatory moments and moments of hope and positivity, it is difficult to make those moments mediagenic. Yeah. And also it's the appetite of the audience because we are so used to having a diet of high action destruction that, uh, that we, we start to give that more credit than a story that's five minutes long about peace seems a little bit tedious. So it's, uh, we have to adjust our own appetites as well, but I do think that there is place in the media to seek out the positive stories and not to represent Gaza as completely helpless. That's why I like the parkour movement where you see these young, empowered, young men really physically capable of jumping from buildings and leaping around it. I just love that. It's on YouTube. Don't be seen. It's great. I think it's called Gaza Parkour. I think it's interesting, like, um, do you think activists need to be better at telling that story rather than just, um, you know, relying on the press to pick up? I think we need to find ways to be better um, and making sure that story about actually, you know, here's the truth, here's our moments of conciliation that actually produce so much more than, than a thing. Um, do you think we need to be better at talking about Well, I think stories? definitely media skills is a really important part of activism. So there's always need and room for, for more communications people in the activist movement, so get yourself out there. <laughs> Brilliant, well, um, thank you for that.